Are you better off this year than you were at this time last year? That is a question that you need to ask yourself. You know, as we approach New Year's, as we welcome in 2022, as we look back at everything that we've been through, through 21 and 20, oh gosh, 2020, right? You have to ask yourself, are you better off today? Are you better off right now than you were one year ago? And you're going to say no. I mean, your natural reaction is to say no. <laughs> Mark, I'm not better off than I am now because over the past year, all these things went wrong. And that's the natural reaction. That's your natural inclination is to say no. But we need to stop. We need to pause. We need to reflect. This is the, this is the perfect time of year before we look at 22, before we decide what's happening next, before we get all excited about the future to actually just stop for a second. Just stop. Because what happens is when we look back over the year, we think of the things that went wrong. We think of the tough moments, the bad moments, the loss, the embarrassment, the challenges, the pain, but we, we don't look at the growth. And so the reason why I, I like to reflect and ask myself this very question, are you better off? I ask myself this, Mark, are you better off than you were one year ago at this time? And then I start to think of, well, where was I one year ago at this time? At this time last year, the podcast, We Do Hard Things, the We Do Hard Things podcast, we had uh, 1,000 subscribers on YouTube, I think, on New Year's Eve. And uh, now we're at like in the mid-20s, 25,000 subscribers. So, so that's some growth. Our community is growing. I think of how many podcasts I released. Um, I think we were somewhere like, eight episodes in, and now we're like 60-something episodes in, and I've been able to have conversations with remarkable people. I think about uh, uh, the network. You know, I jumped onto Clubhouse in February and, gr- and was able to connect with new friends and uh, started working with Les Brown. I mean, <laughs> a year ago, I didn't have Les Brown's cell phone number and couldn't call him up. That's pretty cool. Uh, where was I in terms of a health space? Well, I, I went through my 90-day chunk-to-hunk challenge, and I got healthier than I've ever been in my life. Uh, I got down to to like a crazy lean body mass, uh, and that was amazing. Where was I in terms of like my mental health? Last year at this time, I was in therapy, and I was really struggling with anxiety, and I thought that maybe I might have borderline personality disorder because I was cycling so much from from uh, hopefulness to depression and uh, I mean, that wasn't very much fun. And so the truth is, if you were to ask me, am I better off today than I was a year ago? My initial reaction would be to think of all the things that went wrong and all of the challenges. And I'd probably say no, because when we, when we, when we get asked that question, our, our natural reaction is that things used to be better, right? Sentimentality and we, everything used to be better and, and society was better and life was better and, and there was no pandemic to deal with and all of that stuff. But the truth is, that each year as we mature, as we face new things, as we grow, we have the opportunity to get better. I don't want to diminish real loss. I don't want to diminish real setbacks. But when I ask you this question, are you better off today than you were one year ago, and you really spend time to reflect on it, I think you'll find things that you've not only grown through, but also things that you are grateful for having now that you did not have a year ago. And if you don't, if you can't answer that question that way, if you say, no, I'm not better off than I was a year ago, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you. Why not? Why not? Let's, let's get specific. What are the things that are holding you back? What are the things that are keeping you from being able to answer that question? Yes, I'm better off. And what can you do in 2022 so that way, at this time next year, when I am asking you that same question, you can say, yes, you are better off. A few days ago, I listened back to the message that I, that I released around this time, thanking 2020. And it was so bizarre to hear my voice back, to hear, to hear my message back. And if you go through my YouTube channel or if you go through the podcast stream, you'll be able to see that there's a message called, thank you, 2020. Um, and, and it was just so weird to hear this that, that time capsule of why at the end of 2020, I was, I was happy that uh, 2020 happened. I mean, you know, not many people are happy 
about the pandemic or the setbacks or the financial losses or the new risks that have come into our world or the losses of health and loved ones. I mean, those are some serious challenges. We only get one shot at this, right? That's the truth. The truth is that we get one shot at life and we have to make the most of what we have right now, of what we've been given. And so if you're not better off today than you were a year ago, and you know why, because you've sat down and you've, you've figured out why, you have to face this hard truth. No one is going to fix it for you. No one is going to change it for you. No one is going to come along and make things easier and solve your problems and pull you out of whatever setback or hole or challenge you're facing right now. No one is going to do that. I lost a lot of time waiting for hoping, dreaming, just waiting for people to come along and, and fix these things for me, you know, and in, in business, in health, in life over the last year, what I've realized more than anything else is that it's on me. It feels unfair. It feels like we should get help with this. It feels like that, that the loved ones and, and, and friends and staff and other people should come along and they should see you. They should see where you're at. They should see the place you're in. They should hear what you're saying and they should just, they should just know what you need and then pour that into you. That's how we feel like life should be. But that's not how life is. No one is going to do this for you. No one is going to make life better. No one is going to help you hit the next level. No one is going to help you generate more money or fix broken relationships or do any of the things that you may be struggling with right now. And so I learned this year that nothing is going to change until you change it. No one is going to do this for you until you step up and decide what you want and then do it. And to that end, I mean, the reason why I learned the, we learned through experience it's 2021, I had a lot of experiences, but, but more than that, actually, there were a series of books. You know, part of what I love about you know, hosting the We Do Hard Things podcast and being a host on stage with remarkable people at events and conferences and, and this stuff is that I get the chance to meet crazy cool people who have done really big things. But on top of that, like in preparation for the conversations that I'm hosting, I do a ton of research. I read books. I listen to their past conversations. I, I get ready so that way I can host a great conversation with the person who's standing across from me. And through all of this, there were, let me count this right now. One, two, three, four. There were five books that I, I kind of worked through in a series that helped me unlock, and it was over the course of many, many months, but it helped me unlock a whole bunch of stuff that was holding me back. I want to share with you the key takeaways from those five books because they helped me. I read, I, I don't know what I went through this year. I, I, I mean, there's like, you can see there's stacks of books if you're watching this on YouTube. If you're listening, I'm pointing to stacks of books, which isn't that much fun. But anyway, the, the point is that I worked through a lot of content when we went from eight or 10 episodes at this time last year to 60 Right with all the conversations I hosted on Clubhouse, with with the the events that I went to that I hosted on stage, panels and um, and fireside chats and all that stuff, I spent a lot of time researching and reading stuff and speaking to people, which by the way is the coolest job ever. <laughs> but I, I want to share with you these these five books, and maybe they will help you if 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 you're not in a better place today than you were a year ago or two years ago, if you want 2022 to be a better year than 2021 was or 2020, I hope these five books help you. Number one is, of course, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Now, if you're not familiar with the story, this was written in the 60s, I believe, and then republished in the 80s. But Viktor Frankl was a professor in, uh, he was a Jewish professor during the Second World War, he was put into a concentration camp, separated from his family and his wife, and the manuscript that he was working on as a professor, the, 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 the thesis that he was working on, his life work was taken away from him as he entered the concentration camp. And as he shares this story and tells his story, he noticed um, that certain people kind of just gave up on life, and then a few days, a few weeks later, they would pass away. And other people in the same conditions would hold on to something and they would get through. And the takeaway that I took from this book is that often uh, the people who wait for life to give you meaning, if you're waiting for life to give you your purpose, if you're waiting for life to give you meaning, your work meaning, if you're waiting for some outside force 
God, the universe, whatever it is, to give you meaning, it won't come. His thesis is that it's your job to give life meaning. It's your job to find meaning in your work or to change your work so it brings you meaning. It's your job, your responsibility to go out there and find purpose, to find meaning, and to put it into your life and your work. Because like I said, no one's going to do this for you. You can't stand around and wait for it to happen. And sometimes I think we wait. We wait, we wait for when will, when will I find my purpose? When will uh, I be happy? When will life bring me something? This book was the first step for me realizing, oh man, with what this man faced, with what the other people during the war and in concentration camps faced, with what the survivors fought to get through, what pulled them through that terrible situation was that they brought meaning to their life. What, what's my problem? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a 38-year-old white guy in Canada. What's my, what's my problem Com- compared to this? So that was the first step for me. Number two, uh, by Bonnie Ware, The Five Regrets of the Dying. A few months later, after reading that book, I worked through this book, and I just loved this story. I mean, I, I really liked getting to know Bonnie because it's, it's a bit of a memoir, but, but more than that, what she shares, uh, now Bonnie was uh, a, someone who helped people transition through end-of-life, end-of-life care. So she would basically be with um, uh, people of different ages. Uh, the family would bring her in to basically help their loved ones through the last days, the last weeks, the last months before they passed away. And what she noticed with the people she was working with was that they tend to have the same regrets. Like the regrets always boiled down to these. I wish I had let myself be happier. Wow, that's a big one, right? I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. I wish I had the courage to express my feelings. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself. Wow. You know, that was the big one. I wish I had lived my, I wish I had the courage to live a true life to myself, not the life others expected of me. And so with this book at the time, when I was reading this in, in March of this year, it hit me. If people on their deathbed all have these regrets, Why do we wait until the end of our life to have those regrets? I'm 38 years old. I'm in my, I'm in my thirties. God willing, I will be around for a very long time. And so here is a little experiment I ran and I shared this on the podcast. I've shared this with a bunch of people and everybody kind of nods along and thinks it makes sense. But here's the experiment I ran. I thought, okay, what if each one of these regrets was truth? Right? Like right now, you know, if just because everybody regrets it at the end of their life does not mean that it's truth. But let's just assume that this is true. That at the end of my life, I may say, I wish I had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. I might say, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. I, I might say, I wish I had the courage to express my feelings. I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. I wish I had let myself be happier. Okay, Mark. You're, God, you know, hopefully very, very old and you're dying. What do you have to do today to not have these regrets then? Like, like if this is true, maybe I should live my life with more courage to actually be myself. And maybe I shouldn't work so hard on the things that don't matter. Maybe I should express my feelings more. Maybe I should focus on friendships and relationships. Maybe I should let myself be happy. If these are truths, what do I have to do right now? What do I have to change right now in order to not have those regrets later in life? That was a big, scary unlock for me because what it meant was I had to make a bunch of changes. I had to make a bunch of changes to work, I had to make a bunch of changes to what I was focused on, to what I thought was important in life, uh, the relationships I had. I had to put myself out there and be more willing to be myself and, and not spend so much time kind of worried about what other people thought. 
And let me tell you, that that is scary as hell. But the next thing that helped me after accepting, okay, I don't want to die with those regrets. About a month later, I read this book, Personality Isn't Permanent by Benjamin Hardy. Now, we had we had been on the podcast uh, because I love this book so much. But what this helped me realize is, okay, I, I've, I realized that Man's Search for Meaning, it's my job to bring meaning and purpose to what I do in life. And I, top five regrets of the dying, I don't want to die with regrets. So I'm going to make some bold, courageous changes in my life. But I'm still me. How am I going to change? How am I going to do this? Like, you know, so much of my personality is holding me back, is keeping me stuck, is keeping me here. The family I grew up in, the things that I think, how, you know, my reactions, what I'm afraid of, what comes easy to me. This book, Personality is Impermanent by Benjamin Hardy, helped open up my eyes in, through, through research, through science, and through some amazing stories, and even some really practical tips like, like uh, journaling in the future and other things that you can get into. But it helped me realize that, whoa, we are not fixed at all. One of the biggest takeaways I took from this was that they asked people uh, in a study or, or anecdotally, but they asked people to, to imagine where they will be in the next 10 years. Over the next 10 years, how much will you change? How much will you grow? What will you accumulate? What will you learn? How much will you progress? What will happen over the next 10 years? And, and thinking forward, everyone was like, ah, oh, you know, like, well, I might, I might, you know, make a little more money. I may move into a slightly bigger house. I may have, you know, a little bit more success. It was like really minor. And then they said, okay, well, that's cool. But how much have you changed over the last 10 years? And suddenly people were like, wow, well, okay. You know, it's like, so for me, I'm 30, I'm 38. At 28, I only had, I think, two or, well, I think I had two out of my four kids. We were, um, the company that I've been running now for 15 years was only five years in. We, were, we, weren't, <laughs> we weren't making a lot of money. It was, it was really challenging. Um, I was working really hard gosh, over the last 10 years, so many lessons I've learned. So many areas have matured. My, my relationship with my wife is way stronger than it was 10 years ago. Um, and so looking back, I could see how much I've grown over the last 10 years. But looking forward, it's unclear. It's fuzzy. It seems like not much is going to change. And that's because, as Ben says, we feel like we've arrived we feel like we have arrived. As people, as humans, when we look back, we can see change, but we always feel like this is the end point. And so the big unlock for me was, okay, if I don't want to die with the five regrets of the dying and, and my personality isn't permanent and over the next 10 years, I can change as much or more as I've changed over the last 10 years. Wow. Okay, that's pretty hopeful. That gives me hope. I can change as much or more than I've changed over the last 10 years looking forward for the next 10 years, especially if I do it with consistency and with hard work, and especially if I actually direct my life a little bit more. You know, honestly, over the last 10 years, looking back, it's, it's, I had plans and I had goals, but I wasn't really very good at like directing things as it turns out. But what if I could get better? right? My, my personality is impermanent. What if I could get better at this? What if I could practice? What if I can be intentional with this? And then looking forward over the next 10 years, have high hopes and big dreams and actually work towards those things. That put me in a different mindset. But I, I was bumping up against the fact that this all seemed um, too lofty and it all seemed like, like maybe I couldn't do it, right? I, I couldn't do it. I, I, it. I wasn't enough. So the next book that really, really helped me was It Takes What It Takes by Trevor Moed. This book, It Takes What It Takes by Trevor Moed. Now, Trevor passed away 
what seemed suddenly because, because we weren't aware that he'd been battling cancer for the last two years. But he passed away in the fall. I didn't ever have a chance to meet him. We tried to get him on the podcast. I loved this book so much. It takes what it takes and I've recommended it to so many people and I've even, I've even bought it for people as, as, as a gift because I just feel like the message in there is so, so powerful. He has another book coming out uh, in, in the next few months that I'm looking forward to working through. But um, the premise of the book, It Takes What It Takes, is just the realization that, um, kind of like when I started off by saying no one is going to do this for you, the realization that this is on you. It takes what it takes. You know, he, he shares um, a story about Vince Carter. Vince Carter was an NBA player uh, I know him because uh, I, I live just outside of Toronto, Canada, and he used to play for the Toronto Raptors, but he was getting older in his career. And he talked about the fact, you know, Trevor went up to Vince Carter uh, and asked him, hey, man, like you're in your late 30s and you're still playing NBA level basketball uh, around people who are like teenagers and in their 20s. How are you doing it so late in your life? And Vince Carter said, well, I have to I have to sleep X amount. I have to drink this amount. I have to practice this way. I can't do slam dunks anymore. It's too hard on my knees and my response time is too slow. And and he just started breaking down all of the things that he had to do to be able to play the game he loved. And so this was a huge unlock for me again. Walk through, like, you know, walk through this with me, right? Man's search for meaning. It's my responsibility to find purpose and meaning. Five regrets of the dying. I don't want to live the rest of my life looking back and regretting why I did the things that I did. Personality is impermanent. Over the next 10 years, I have the ability to turn it into almost whomever I want to be if I do it with intention. It takes what it takes. Oh, these next 10 years in that intention, it's going to take certain sacrifice. It's going to take certain hard work. And this is where people break down. This is where people run into problems and challenges because we set a goal, we set an intention, we hope things will happen, but are we willing to do what it takes to get there? You can become almost anyone that you want to become, especially if you lean into your God-given gifts. You can go and do almost anything, especially if you're not concerned with failing or looking stupid or worried about what other people think of you. And I know these things, and it's really hard. It's really hard to believe them. But as I worked through 2021, I started working through these. I started stacking each of these lessons and reminding myself of them. Okay, Mark, it takes what it takes. And in the spring, I looked at my business that I've been running for 15 years. I looked at the podcast, you know, We Do Hard Things, that I had been putting out. I looked at what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And I realized a few things. The podcast wasn't represented. It wasn't, it wasn't what I wanted it to be. It takes what it takes. Let's fix it. My company, I was not happy with. It wasn't, it, it wasn't making me happy. The, the, the work, the type of work, the clients, it just, it, just, the, you know, it just wasn't working. And I sat down and said, what do I want this to be? And I started penciling out how I wanted it to be. And I realized in the spring, I wasn't willing to do the work it was going to take to turn it into what I wanted it to be. That was a hard realization. Really, really, really hard to want something, to invest in it, to put time into it, but to realize that I wasn't actually willing to put in what it would take to make it work. People run into this all the time with their health. I heard Mel Robbins <laughs> talk about this on stage once, and I loved it. It stuck with me. She wants abs. She knows to get abs, she has to eat a certain amount of things or not too much things, and she needs to work out a certain amount. She's not willing to do that. right? Like she, I think what she said was like, I like wine too much or something like that. But it was just like she's, she wants the abs, but she's not willing to give up the wine. It takes what it takes. Mel, I hope that I'm not butchering that. I probably am. But... And so that was a huge unlock again. It takes what it takes. 
okay, we want these things. And, and you know, I'm, I'm doing my 90-day chunk to hunk challenge where for the first time in my life in my late 30s, I'm working at getting really aggressively fit. And I'm looking to drop, I got my body percentage fat down to 13%. And, and I got down to 168 pounds when for most of my life I was in the 200s. It took what it took. It takes what it takes. And then the last book was Extreme Ownership by uh, Jocko and Leif Babin. Now, that is just another extension of It Takes What It Takes, but the Extreme Ownership is realizing, it's realizing that a lot of us live in a victim mentality. I have a tendency to live in a victim mentality, right? It's And, and it's like, well, but you don't understand. Like, I can't lose weight because, or, or you know, it's just I, I came from this family, or I believe this certain thing, or, or you know, I don't, I don't have the money, or like, it's just, it's all of the like, I can't do it because, it's excuses, right? And when things go wrong and you get mad at others, it's extreme ownership says it's your responsibility. It says everything is your responsibility. If your team isn't succeeding, it's your fault even when it's their fault. It's your fault because you didn't set up the systems or the processes or the tools to keep them from making those mistakes. Or when you're you know, getting in an argument with someone because you miscommunicated, it's your fault because you didn't communicate well enough. Everything is your fault. And at the same time, if you believe everything is your fault and the person that you're working with or speaking to or living with or whatever it is, the person across from you, if they believe everything is their fault, if you guys both own that, extreme ownership, right? No, 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 no. It's not your fault. It's my fault. It's my fault. I didn't do what I needed to do and I've learned that lesson now. I'm going to work a lot harder next time. And they're going, no, 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 Mark, it's my fault because I didn't, I didn't get ahead of it and I didn't realize you needed this and I didn't understand why you were asking. If you guys both, if everybody approaches everything with an extreme ownership, things change so quickly because you're not wasting time blaming others. You're not living in, in a point of, of trying to look perfect or look good. Like you're not worried about that stuff. You're just worried about fixing things, looking at the cold, hard truth. And what do you need to do to fix it? And so working through these books again, and the reason why I said, are you happier today? Are you better off today than you were one year ago? And I can say that I am is, is literally because of these lessons. And many, so many, so many more micro moments along the way, so many more great conversations and help and falling down and failing and getting back up and getting depressed and all of that stuff, all of that stuff that life is. But realizing that it's my job to bring meaning to what I do with man's search for meaning and that I do not want to die with these types of regrets that I learned in the top five regrets of the dying. And even doing the experiment, like, can I change my life today in order to not have to face those things in the future? Realizing that my personality isn't permanent, and if I just work towards something with intention over the next 10 years, that I can change so much so quickly. But also understanding that it's going to take some hard work. It takes what it takes in order to get there. And then lastly, taking ownership over all of the good and all of the bad with extreme ownership and understanding that this is on me. Let me tell you, it it, it changed. It changed what I think it changed um, how I approach life and work and business and prioritizing things. It's, it's allowed me to actually slow down. It's taken some of the pressure off of the, the, the need to move super quick and get everything perfect all the time. And it's just, you know, I I can list other books that have also super, super duper helped me, you know, like growth, uh, or sorry, mindset by Carol Dwick and, um, gosh, uh, big love by, by, uh, Scott Stabil, who was on the podcast and, and so many other great books just really helped shape things. But these five books in this order really help me change my thinking. And so I do not need you to read these five books. I don't need you to read them in this order. If you want to, I think that would be super cool. You can let me know what you think. But what I want to challenge you on for 2022 is I want to make sure that this time next year, you have had a better year than you had in 21, even if it was a good year and better than 20 and better than 19 
and better than 18. Every season in life, whether we're on a peak or whether we're in a valley, whether we, we feel like we're winning or whether life is giving us the opportunity to learn some hard lessons by facing those hard things, it's on you to get this sorted out. It's on you to fix it. And I can tell you, I'm a testimonial because I've just spent the last year experimenting my way through this. It makes a massive difference. Don't you want to be happy? Don't you want to be challenged? Don't you want to be released from the feeling that you have to be perfect or that you have to show up looking great or that you can't make mistakes? I mean, what a tightrope we find ourselves walking on. Don't you want to get up in the morning and look at the day ahead and go, I get to do this? This is my day? And not every moment will be like that. And not every day will be like that. We still, (laughs) life still surprises us. It still kicks us down. We still have fears. We still have doubts. We still are uncertain. But don't you want more days where you're happy and you're feeling purposeful and you're making strides towards good things? Like, don't you want more of those days than fewer? Don't you want to no longer feel trapped in relationships that don't serve you, in a job that you're not happy with? Like, gosh, I just think of all the people who are scraping to get by, not financially, like they're scraping to get by in relationships that don't really serve them, fulfill them, and they're not showing up for others. I think of all the people who are scraping to get by at a job because they're working for a pension or for one day. I think of all the entrepreneurs who are in the, 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 the rat race or the cycle on the treadmill of just trying to keep everything going for something that honestly, honestly, isn't worth the, the health risk or the stress and it's just not paying off. I just think of all the wasted time and wasted money and wasted energy that go into the things that we think will make us happy that won't. And so, you know what? Go back and listen to my message from last year, the thank you 2020 message or whatever. And then having listened to this one, what a massive difference for me. And I am so excited. I'm so excited about 2022 because I just think for me, you know, this, this journey really started in 2018. 2018 at the end of the year, uh, you know, I, I, I got really unhappy. I got really depressed my friend Evan took me to Tony Robbins. We went to Unleash the Power Within, changed some things up here. And then in 19, I went back again, made some more changes. 20, we all know what happened. 2020, did not expect that. But my goodness, has the last year been a year of growth for me? And I do not say that to brag. I do not say that if you're not in the same place. I don't want to make you feel terrible or make you feel bad. I say that because I just, I just want to give you some hope. That if you start to face these hard and scary and difficult things in your life, if you start to take control to start that next thing or to untrap yourself, unwind yourself from the cage that you've built kind of around you, if you do these hard things, if you start to pursue your passions, facing the setbacks and making the sacrifices, you have the chance to live a bigger and bolder and happier life for the rest of your life. Isn't it worth it? Isn't it worth it? I think it is. And if you agree with me, then I want to hear from you what you're doing. Leave a comment below. Drop me an email if you want to, mark at markdrager.com. Find me on IG and let me know. But as we go to 2022, I want to leave you with this. Thank you for listening. Thank you for participating. And please, 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 let's make sure that at this time next year, we have the chance to say we're even better off than we are today. Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, Happy Holidays, all of that stuff. I'll see you around.